Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India So, welcome to today's topic, which is on optical microscopy and molecular imaging. So, this is uh, basically the last module which we are going to cover on uh, uh, all the modalities over here. So, we have already covered down modules on CT, MR, ultrasound, which are majority of uh, macro imaging modalities where you look into larger parts of your body and the whole body in uh, as a whole in total. Now, in microscopy is where you will be looking into very specific part of your body and now this is more of aimed at a portion of looking into just say one of the cells, one single cell or a cluster of cells within your body which was not possible with any of the other modalities over there. And from there enter into a very interesting phenomena called as molecular imaging and this molecular imaging is where uh, initially we will do it for molecular imaging for uh, microscopy and from there we will move on to molecular imaging on the mass scale as well. So, this lecture is arranged something like this. So, I would be introducing you to you the microscope instrumentation and then the concepts of optical magnifications, what is an objective and what are specifications of an objective, the relation between numerical aperture and light cone and the image resolution and what we mean by depth of focus. From there uh, to two different modes of microscopy which is transmission and reflected light microscopy. Although reflected light microscopy is not something which is very traditionally used for uh, medical applications, it is used more of for uh, material sciences applications, but we do have one specific mode of operation called as fluorescence microscopy in which reflected light microscopy is the basic principle and that is where you get introduced to molecular imaging for the first time. And from there I would enter into molecular imaging on the macroscopic scale with uh, SPECT and PET. So, uh, this is what a microscope uh, looks like. So, you might have seen them in your high school as well or, or some other experiments in some point of time. Now, what it has is this part is basically a very sturdy body thing and uh, you have some objectives over here which is an assembly of uh, lenses stacked one beyond the other and you have a few lenses over here which are called as tube lenses which are again for the purpose of magnification. There is a small prism over here which basically divides the light onto this part which is which goes into your eyepiece where you put your eyes and look into and the other part of the light comes out over here which is called as the camera tube. You can put a digital camera over here something like your webcam and just acquire those digital images over there. Now, the light comes down from this part which is called as a light source. So, uh, if you were in your looking at your high school microscopes then you had uh, some sort of a small mirror. A uh, concave mirror, and you had to take it somewhere near the window and do your experiments over there. In more of these microscopes, since we do not make them move them a lot and carry them along where the sun moves, so we have a light box in which you just have one simple lamp and a diffuser placed over there, and then this whole light passes through this uh, assembly. So, from there, uh, we can control down the total uh, width of the uh, light which is coming out using this field diaphragm and aperture control diaphragms over here together such that we have a very narrow focused cone of light passing down through the lens. Okay. So, this is the standard uh, diagram of any kind of a microscope. So, be it from a very cheap microscope you used in your high school to a very high end microscope which we have in the demonstrator on uh, using a microscope for imaging and image acquisition. So, all of them have the same sort of a path connection diagram. Now, when you have uh, these objectives which are placed on top of the uh, object placed on a uh, slide, then this kind of a microscope is called as an upright uh, microscope. In other kind of a microscope which we will see in the demonstration as well, these uh, set of objectives are placed over here which is below and the light box is on top. So, that is just say vertically flipped uh, configuration of this microscope. So, you have to look at the eyepiece which is present over here as well. So, that kind of a microscope where the objective is below the sample that is called as an inverted microscope. Yes, it is an inversion of the optical design of this one that is the only difference between them. Otherwise, the rest of the imaging and physics remains the same. Now, from there let us enter into 
what this microscope does. Now I will uh, try to uh, again review the concept of uh, optical magnification. Now say that you had an object over here and through a lens you were looking at it. Now if the object is quite far off from the focal plane, so you would uh, from the focal length of, of this lens, then you would see a very smaller uh, version of it casted on your image over here and that is a very small one. Now if I keep on changing the distance between my eye and the lens as well as the distance between the lens and the uh, object over there, I would eventually come down to a mid level magnification where I have almost the same size casted over here. And if they are very close to each other, then I would see that the total image which is casted over here is much wider and that is what is called as optical magnification in any way. So the total image which is cast on my retina or which is cast on the sensor is much bigger than what it is in actual practice, then it is so. And microscope gets its name from the perspective that it can magnify objects in the order of micro, which is in micron. So 10 power of minus 6 of a centimeter is what gets magnified to in the order which is visible with naked eye. So in the order of centimeters is what is visible to naked eye. So if I magnify something in the order of 10 power minus 6 to a order of 10 power minus 2, then it makes it visible to the human eye in a, in a very uh, direct sense. So that is what uh, optical magnification means uh, in its direct way and a microscope just does this part of it. Now it is not just optical microscope that you have, you have other microscope like electron microscope. Uh, and atomic force microscopes which are very different from it. But when, whenever in terms of medical image analysis and digital pathology we speak about optical uh, microscopy, then it, it just means that there are lenses and it is a lens based microscope and I am trying to magnify micron level appearances to something which is visible with naked eye. Now one important thing which plays this major role in this magnification is called as the objective. Now what this does is this is basically a set of collection of lenses which will help you in magnifying. So instead of using one single lens which will make it really big and thicker and you will no more have the thin lens phenomena, you can put a cascade of lenses and pack them together. So this is one cylinder in which there are multiple lenses which are packed uh, together and such that you get a very high magnification. Now if you look at it typically you would have, uh, so I, I, we do not have any uh, uh, so relation with Zeiss as such, it was just one of these designs I took and more from the reason that uh, we would be demonstrating on one of the microscope which has this kind of, sign of kind of a lens over there. So it makes it easier for us to go through it. So one first part which you would see over there is the magnification. So this is a 63 times magnification one. So whatever comes over here is 63 times magnified when you look through this one. So this is the primary. Uh, condition of objective. So you have objectives state starting from 4x to 10x to uh, 20x to 40x, 63x, 100x, which is a standard configuration. Now this is the first part which you will have to keep in mind. The second one is that what is the focal correction? So this is infinity corrected which means that whatever you see over here is a parallel beam and it would appear as if the object is placed at infinity and you are seeing that object over there which is quite important otherwise if this uh, looks into a particular point that means that along this optical turret over there or wherever we had the tube lenses then those tube lenses will also be have to place be placed exactly at the focus point. Now if you are moving this objective up and down in order to uh, look into your focus points then your tube lenses will also have to move and it becomes a very complicated optical arrangement to solve. That is why we generally prefer to have a focal correction at infinity, but there are some microscopes and some lenses which have certain limitations for which they do not offer and they do make it very uh, implicitly mentioned over here as well. Now uh, the other part is this is a neoflor uh, lens and uh, what that means is that generally uh, if you are looking down, so uh, think of this one that say you have a prism and you have a white beam of light going down over there. So you will have a spectral slicing across the prism from VIBG or total. Now a lens is basically uh, two different prisms with their bases together. Okay. So obviously there is going to be some diffraction and now every point which is on focus that would not say there is a white point in focus on the other side, but that white point will no more appear as white whereas there will be a rainbow like pattern which comes down over there. Now we do not want to have that one because we want colors preserved and everything otherwise this will create some sort of an optical distortion. Now in order to get rid of that what they do is 
uh, we put down certain uh, chemical coatings on top of the lens such that for different wavelengths there are different refractive index indices such that all of them converge at the same point and a white spot is again seen as a white spot you do not have optical aberrations. So, neofluor is a particular grade of such lens which specifies as to what is the amount of optical aberration uh, which is present over in that lens and these are something which are of very good quality otherwise it is it is uh, so a standard one is just a plan lens from there you will be getting down a floor lens from there you get a achrom apochromatic lens and um, uh, and different varieties as well. So, the other part is uh, whenever you have a very high magnification lens over there you cannot just put it. So, it has to be very close to the object. So, as we were looking into that earlier slide where for higher magnification the lens is actually very close to the object. Now, if, if it is very close it will just go and touch the surface of the object. So, over there in order to uh, avoid some wear and tear because of the object and the glass rubbing against each other we basically put down some uh, kind of a lubricant and generally this can be something like a glycerin or oil or water and now the other point is that since you have some lubricant and everything placed over there. So, this can leak inside the lens as well and that can create other kind of optical distortions you do not want that to happen. So, there are certain sealing jackets and mechanical design constraints. So, that are also mentioned over here. So, this lens it points down as W. So, it is a water immersion lens. So, you can use it only with water. So, please do not use it with oil or anything and you need to be very cautious in the designs over there because these are specified and you you need to use them only with those specified uh, fluids for immersion over there. So, there are air immersion lenses now which are to be operated in air you cannot use those lenses with water otherwise water would leak in and that would distort the whole optical arrangement and, and the durability of the lens as such. So, once we are done with this one now another interesting fact which is observed is uh, the effect of numerical aperture and light cone. Now, what happens is something like this that if your object is very far off and uh, from the lens then you have a very small cone being projected over there and as the cone is small your numerical aperture which is dependent on n times sin theta and n is the refractive index of the material through which it is passing. So, in this part it is just air. So, refractive index is 1. So, your numerical aperture is again low because your theta over here is low. So, now, as you keep on moving this object close to it your numerical aperture is also going to be high because your theta is going to be high. Now, you need to keep something in mind that the numerical aperture or the angle of this cone should be matched with the angle of the cone of the objective as well. So, your object because if you have a lower numerical aperture of this lens over there and you are putting it at a higher numerical aperture over here then you will basically have a less amount of light passing down over there you cannot collect effective amount of light. And now if you have a smaller numerical aperture uh, smaller angle of the uh, light being casted on the lens and you have a lens with a wider numerical aperture then you are getting going to get a lot of stray reflections coming from the sides which is just going to be noise. So, the quality of image actually depends a lot on matching the numerical aperture to the light cone of the object which is being done and uh, you generally from a user's perspective you do not need to be worried too much about them because these are matched down by the manufacturers themselves over there and uh, for each lens it is pre calibrated where you put the objective and where you put the sample and what should be the numerical aperture for that objective as well. But if you are changing down objectives, uh, so if you want to replace one of your native objectives with a new objective then do keep in mind and recalibrate the whole system this is one thing to be kept in mind. The other part is now that we have looked into that numerical aperture and I said what will a mismatch cause over there does this have some relation with image resolution as well it should in some way right. Now, uh, what I do is a very simple experiment over there. So, assume that there are small beads placed down over there and each of them is appearing in white and now if you are using a very lower numerical aperture what would happen is you will not be able to discriminate between the beads in a very good way. So, what is the structure and resolution you are trying to look and what is the numerical aperture you will have to choose is, is very much selective of that at a lower numerical aperture you get a much lower resolution. So, discriminability is not that good at a higher numerical aperture you will get a much higher resolution you get a good amount of discriminability. The downside is something called as an airy disc effect and what this means is that since you have a whole series of lenses coming down over there. So, they will introduce some sort of an aberration over there eventually 
now cumulatively they start producing if it is a spherical object then it will start producing some sort of rings around over there and these are again dependent on those frequency uh, effects which are over here because you do not have an infinity projecting lens you are just taking a small part of the light over there. So, you are truncating down all the uh, high frequency light or, or the rest of the uh, ref incident rays which are needed to reconstruct this image perfectly. Now, because of that at a higher numerical aperture uh, you will start tend to tending to have these kind of ringing artifacts over there although you have a much higher resolution. So, these are what come down into some advanced concepts on microscopy and how to get rid of them is what we will study in the case study uh, part over there as well. Now, another interesting fact is called as uh, focus depth. So, what this does is as I said from my earlier example that you have some sort of an aberration always being created because your lens is not a uh, actual planar lens and then it is made out of say assume two different prisms and they will be causing now spectral distortions over there. Now, for that reason what happens is that if you have a very high numerical aperture your depth of focus actually becomes very lower whereas, if you have a lower numerical aperture your depth of focus is larger. Now, if what this would allow is that in this depth of focus wherever be your object placed you will always get a fo image which is in focus. So, now the total uh, say span over which you have or the tolerance on which you can do it for a lower numerical aperture is much larger than the total tolerable limit which you can have for a higher numerical aperture. And for this reason what you would see is when you are at a higher magnification you have to be very cautious in tuning down your uh, focus point for that object whereas, if you are in a lower magnification you do not have that problem. So, when we uh, uh, later on in the lecture when I will be demonstrating out with an actual practical microscope I would be showing these and uh, telling you about how the problems will occur in them as well. So, as a simple example say the if you want to look at the effect. So, this is just a bunch of three different uh, thread strands over here you would see that the red thread is now in focus whereas, the yellow thread does not appear in focus and this blue thread also does not appear in focus because they are somewhere much above this focal zone over there. So, now uh, this does uh, allow us another interesting thing that you can basically uh, move up and down and sort of create a tomographic projection of the microscopic objects as well by looking into their in focus planes, but uh, that is not something which we are going to discuss in this lecture that is in the case studies in the last week when we are going to look into uh, microscopy in much more details. So, these were some of the aspects you need to keep in mind and with that I move on to another variant of a microscope which is called as a reflected microscope. So, in transmission light microscope what you had seen is that there was light box over here you could see the light going from here to your objective. In reflected microscope it is interesting that there is a light box which is placed somewhere over here light comes down through your objective piece over here. Now, what happens is that say you have an object and this is opaque. So, if you have a light coming down from here it will never pass and I cannot see anything. Now, for that if I want to do I need to have the light from top and then look through it. So, the only pipeline through which I can send this light is basically my objective, but again I have to be cautious that the same light should not go into my eye pieces over there. Otherwise, if the same light goes into my eye piece then I am going to get blinded and I will not be able to see what is there on this object. So, there is a splitter over here which does the purpose of that one. So, that I can use uh, the same objective for illumination as well as for uh, looking back at the reflected light. Now, with this kind of a microscope the practical application is actually in fluorescence imaging. So, here what happens is that um, uh, so, this is a initial introduction to molecular imaging. So, here what we do is we have some sort of chemical compounds which are called as fluorophores and they are certain uh, compounds which will bind onto certain specific kind of proteins on my cells. And now say I want to look into mitochondria I want to look into certain sort of uh, uh, DNA structures and strands over there and certain kind of protein structures then I can actually have a different color representation coming for each of them. And then based on what wavelength I am exciting which is getting selected from the filter banks present over here then it will have created different excitation. So, in fluorescence what we do is typically we have a different excitation emission spectra ratio over there and we do. Uh, imaging at individual time. So, for one particular frequency I take down this blue excitations coming for the second one I take the green excitation and for the other one I take the red fluorescing protein excitations. Now, using all of these three together 
we can resynthesize an image which is basically an addition of all the three color planes in these three images. So, these images are not necessarily which appear in color because typically we put down a monochromatic sensor over here to have a much higher photon yield over there. So, they are again pseudo colored and back retraced onto producing uh, my uh, tricolor or multicolor fluorescence images. So, this is a molecular image of a splitting cell. So, you would be seeing down the whole uh, splitting phenomena, the main nucleus over here and, and the splitting in the DNA uh, present over here. So, you can uh, although these are not used typically for standard medical uh, diagnostic purposes, but we do make use of fluorescence imaging a lot for uh, research purposes and for understanding biology of certain disease processes in total. These are much more advanced microscopy than you would be using in a day to day uh, clinical uh, diagnosis uh, platform. Now that we have known about the use of these kind of molecular markers for uh, in fluorescence microscopy, one question would definitely strike us as can we use them for macro imaging as well. I mean I just want to look into, uh, so from the CT to T1, T2 and everything we had seen uh, that from CT to X-rays to MRs, I can look into the structure of the body. Now I want to look at what function is a particular structure doing or say different tissue layers within a particular organ if they are behaving in a different functional way and I just want to look at it. So, in order to do that you can again use molecular markers, but these are a bit different because they are not optical emitting one, but they are they say they are responsive to X rays or gamma rays and we can find out what object is behaving in what way. So, one of the first one is called a single photon emission computed tomography or a SPECT system, which is very much useful in order to look into gamma photon generation uh, uh, from radionucleides. So, what we do is we basically uh, put down a radio isotrope uh, along with uh, glucose and just uh, give it to the patient over there. Now, if, if certain organ uh, has more amount of glucose consumption than other organs over there, so I would see more of radionuclide traces coming down from there. But given the fact that these radionuclide traces, they are just sparse phenomena which occurs only once. So, you need a very good kind of a detector over there coming down which can trace down one single photon which is coming down, one single gamma photon. And that is why uh, this kind of a tomographic system is called as a SPECT system. Now, the resolution generally offered is much lower. So, this is a raw resolution, this is just a corrected resolution over there. And that is why you always have a structural uh, scan system, either a structural CT or a structural MR along with a SPECT and these two images are registered together in order to come down to a diagnosis about the by both knowing the structure and the function along that structure because these uh, molecular imaging they do not give you a very high structural resolution as such. So, the other one is called as a positron emission tomography and uh, what this does is whenever there is a positron emitted you would see a annihilation created and a pair of gamma photons created over there. So, this means that I always need to have a pair of detectors which are 180 degree apart and if these are rotating then I will be sensing down a pair of incidences. So, this actually helps in reducing a lot of noise coming down. So, noise will be independent on each detector, but if it is a pair wise production and then compensated with the travel time, then I can always predict down in space exactly from where my uh, proton was emitted over there and uh, uh, my, my po positron was emitted and that is the concept of a positron emission tomography. This is also used in couple with a CT or an MR because the general resolution offered for this one is much lower and you would need a coupled one in order to get a much higher structural resolution as well. So, since uh, so these are to just give you a basic introduction and, and an idea of what different modalities are and you can read more about uh, these modalities which we have discussed on microscopy and molecular imaging in Tony's guide to medical imaging on the chapter 2 on digital imaging techniques and uh, for microscopy you can have this wonderful tutorial from Zeiss campus magnets at uh, FSU and uh, they have very interactive tutorials which are flash based and you can uh, just move through them and um, change different configurations of a microscope and see what happens to the light beam or the image formation process together. So, with that we come and end to uh, the first week of lectures on getting introduced in the second week we are going to start with uh, more of uh, uh, basic introduction to analytical tools which are useful for uh, medical image analysis and eventually we build up on top of them. So, with that thank you.
Welcome to this uh, demonstration on optical microscopy and um, although this is a very high end microscope which is for the purpose of showing how uh, you would be acquiring digital images in perspective of taking them for digital pathology applications. But uh, in general uh, any, any standard microscope would have uh, basically an illumination uh, over here. So, since this is we are operating it in a bright fold and a bright field and a transmission mode microscopy. So, you have your illumination this is from where the light source comes down and uh, somewhere over here you would be um, seeing down the objective over there. And now since the uh, and from there the rest of the optical assembly is housed inside over here. This is my control knob for changing my illumination which I can uh, increase or decrease and here is my eyepiece from which I can actually look into. Uh, so, generally if I do not want to look under the screen side of it I would be looking through this particular piece and uh, I can see everything magnified uh, on the present on my uh, slide over there. So, I would be demonstrating basically with uh, three different slides today and uh, uh, one of them is hematoxylate and eosin stained H and D stained slide, the other one is uh, pass uh, paradic acid shift staining and the other one is. Uh, uh, Van Gimsa staining over there. So, these uh, three slides are what I would be showing down through this microscope and, and, and they are basically the same tissue block uh, subsequent serial sections neighboring sections which are stained down by independent uh, individual slides. Now, as for a microscope we had done on the lecture theory over there. So, uh, we have a set of beam splitters. So, over here uh, since this is a research level 1 it allows you to um, show whether you want to turn all the uh, like the light 50 50 part into this uh, objective over here and you want to turn the rest of the 50 part into your side port which has the camera mounted. So, on this uh, microscope you would be seeing there is a uh, camera this is the digital camera in blue which you see. So, in this particular configuration I can see both on my objective uh, over here on the eyepieces and I can see whatever is coming from the objective on the camera and on my digital screen over there. Now, moving back onto the digital screen where I have all of my controls. So, initially we are using just a 10x objective uh, over here for our magnification. We can change over to a 20x magnification, 5x, 40x as and when we require them. There is also an 100x one and there is a 40x uh, with oil immersion also available. So, in total this one has 6 different objectives which are available. Uh, so, without uh, taking much more time explaining them because they are not what is objective of our whole uh, class over here. So, I am taking initially this uh, hematoxylin and eosin stain slide over here and I am just going to put it over there. Now, remember that since the objective is from below this is a inverted microscope uh, this kind of an objective one the where, where you have the objective on top and you are seeing that is called as an upright microscope. So, since it is inverted microscope and if you look on this slide you will see uh, a small uh, segregation over here which is my cover slip which is used to prevent down uh, oxidation over here. So, basically there is a slide the tissue section which is stained and then I put down this cover slip on top of it to prevent oxidation. Now, this layer this side. So, there are two. So, this is one surface of the slide this is the other surface of the slide. I am supposed to put this surface which has the tissue section over there closer to the objective lenses. So, that is why I am going to mount it this way on over this microscope. So, the moment I mount it uh, you can see some things on the screen and uh, now the next thing I will have to do is basically do a focusing control over there and try to focus on uh, what I am able to see on the screen. So, as you see uh, I mean to a untrained eye this would basically appear as if uh, uh, garbled and what I am doing is I have a stage position control knob over here which is present over here this can do my x y direction movements as well as my uh, up and down movement. So, so this is what I see now, now this is a uh, section of the biopsy of oral tissue. So, you would be seeing down your epithelium and then the basement membrane somewhere over here and since this is oral submucous fibrosis, so just below the mucosa you do have a lot of uh, fibrous uh, uh, cells and fibrous tissues present over there. Now, I mean that is that is part of the pathology which we are going to discuss. Now, for the control side of it um, 
um, uh, since this is again a standard camera, so as I keep on changing my illumination, obviously I am going to see changes over there and now I have my overexposure uh, indicator on. So these regions, these particular pixels over here are already getting saturated and overexposed. Okay. So given that I am at a particular exposure level, the first thing I would be doing is setting it down to a exposure compensation and after that the best one is to do a auto white balancing. This is what it comes on auto white balancing but um, the cardinal rule always for white balancing is that whatever however you whatever you see with your eyes the same color is to be reproduced on the screen as well and uh, again taking into account the non-linearity in mapping down colors by the monitor itself we have to invert that together so together it should be something like what i am seeing on these eyepieces just for the purpose we cannot fit a camera on this eyepiece to show you guys so i am trying to basically match down that color with this one so the our best practices are you basically look over here you know what is the color of the tissue and the color of these so color of the tissue and and this over here so th this part is supposed to be a bit more yellowish in nature and that's what's not coming down over here so what we will do is we go down to the advanced settings on the uh, axio cam uh, controller over here which is the camera controller and start a interactive white balancing by picking up a location say i pick up this particular location and now i see that since this part was supposed to match down with my color this actually does a good uh, decent job of color compensation over there and is a very important step uh, whenever you are doing digital pathology because col otherwise color shifts will introduce major chroma shifts and your algorithms might not work. So that is one part of it. Now uh, coming to the major parts that since you have different magnifications and what happens over here. So this is at a particular magnification. Now I change this one to 20x over here. So it moves and then uh, puts me on a 20x magnification. Obviously, I see there is a lot of uh, uh, part which got overexposed and that is because uh, in, in particular 20x magnification, you have a much smaller area which is being seen and then the total amount of light to be compensated and matched down with the numerical aperture has to be appropriately done. So basically, I am going to pull down my intensity levels over there, then do another level of exposure compensation and a white balancing. And again that I see this change coming down, I will go into my camera settings over there, do an interactive one and balance it out and now I have it perfect. So I we do see that some part of it is again out of focus, so I need to focus it very carefully. So this is where I get most of my objects now in focus. Okay. Now if I change, this is how it would be translating and you can see. Now at this particular magnification of 20x you can rather make out all of these individual nuclei for the first time which was not so evident in 10x magnification. So from there I move on to say 40x on my uh, air mount one over there and I have a much higher magnification but I just need to focus all my objects. So now that we are at a 40x objective magnification you can see that uh, the cells uh, and the nuclei, so the cellular membrane over here as well as the nucleus is quite quite distinctly visible which was not there in lower magnification. So these are the different uh, effects different magnifications have and what we use over there for uh, individual purposes. So this was about an HND stained slide, now I am going to change this one and uh, put down another slide which is uh, called as Van Giesen staining or VG. So let us position it over there at 40x I again try to put them onto yeah. So this is my Now you have your epithelium region again present over there. So for a different stain you have a different way. One thing you see is this is actually reddish in color uh, for a Van Giesen stain. You do not have the bluish uh, staining component present over there at all. So I can change this one and uh, let us put down a pass staining for iodic acid shifts reagent stain over here. So I have placed it now I am going to just center it appropriately. And somewhere I am close to it, I do a fine focus control and yes, now I am at over here. 
okay. So, this was the effect of uh, different stains and uh, some common magnifications over there. You have many more modes supported on it, it can do fluorescence microscopy, it can do uh, dark field microscopy with phase contrast as well, but uh, our, our whole subject is related only to digital pathology which is again with bright field microscopy only and uh, this is one of those examples of how to use microscopes for digital pathology. So, uh, the details have been covered over here, we have a much more detailed case study on a digital pathology problem as well somewhere in the fourth uh, week, upcoming fourth week over there. So, with that thanks.